talk about tranexamic acid. I understand that tranexamic acid is a popular worldwide drug, but in speaking with many of you recently, I've understood there's some potential barriers with its use in Mexico uh, for some strange reasons. Um, I'll start off with a story. There's, there's no doubt the way that I found out about tranexamic acid was from one of my really close friends and, and great mentors, and that was uh, this man, okay, Matt Davis. Matt was a resident in surgery. I was an emergency resident, and so we spent a lot of time together. And we went through our training. Matt did his fellowship at Baltimore Shock Trauma, one of the world-renowned locations for trauma surgery. And then he came back to our facility to be our lead director of trauma at our trauma center. And when we had national headlines such as mass shootings at Fort Hood, and when we had fertilizer plants explode in West Texas, we were the center that took care of these patients. We were on the national spotlight, and Matt was our man. He was our lead point. He was the one that Matt Lauer would do interviews with and was on the national news, and he was a growing international speaker and leader in trauma and critical care. And Matt worked very hard, as you can imagine, but he also liked to play hard. And three years ago, Matt lost his life in Colorado in a climbing accident. And so I dedicate this talk to my friend because he told me, he said, Scott, provide maximal aggressive care for your patients. One of the ways we're going to do this is we're going to start using this medicine called tranexamic acid. And so uh, in Matt's memory, I speak to you today. I've got four basic objectives that we're going to discuss. First of all, what, what is tranexamic acid? I feel like it is a very misunderstood medication that we don't know enough about. And I think it's critical to understand its pharmacology, to understand its application and use. It's got a rich research history, and many of that has been done over the past decades. It extends back into the you know, World War II time in the 1940s when it was first discovered in the 50s, and it's been studied quite a bit throughout the, the, the time. And it had a low point, but it's coming back. I'm going to apply tranexamic acid to some cases of some very sick patients and find out how you might consider using this medicine in situations. And also, there's some very big research that's being done right now on this medicine, which is going to, I think, change the way that we deal with patients who are having acute bleeding. So first of all, what is tranexamic acid? This is a medicine that binds to the lysine analog on plasminogen. Now you remember that when plasminogen meets up with TPA, it then goes down and forms plasmin and it dissolves clots that have already formed. Now, when tranexamic acid is given, it blocks the binding site on plasminogen and then it cannot come down and perform its job of fibrinolysis. And so the first big point that I think we need to understand about tranexamic acid, tranexamic acid is not a procoagulant. Tranexamic acid does not cause clots. It is a antifibrinolytic. It stops existing clots from being broken down. A very important concept for us to understand. What does it do to our body? When somebody takes tranexamic acid, where does it go? How does it affect us? First of all, it crosses over in the blood-brain barrier, so it gets into our brain. It is in our saliva 30 minutes after a rinse. When given, it's highly concentrated in our lung, livers, and kidneys. It lasts about two to three hours. It does cross the placenta, and that's important to note for our patients that might be pregnant. It also goes into our aqueous humor, and there's been some studies done on hythema, but it's, it's not turned out well. I'm not going to discuss that because it's just not really applicable. And then it does require renal dosing. The cost of tranexamic acid in my center is about $10 to $20, 400 pesos. We know about tranexamic acid from probably the most popular trial that occurred in the early 2000s. This was the CRASH trial. 20,000 patients, international, multi-center study, double-blind, randomized control, much better than the studies I talked about earlier. This was a good trial. They compared tranexamic acid versus placebo, 
and it looked at patients that were in traumatic accidents that needed resuscitation and bleeding needed to be stopped non-operatively. And what they did is they found it had a number needed to treat of 67, no thrombosis rate increase compared with placebo. So again, antifibrinolytic, not procoagulant. This put tranexamic acid on the map. It was followed again by the MATTERS trial. Now this was a US military trial that was done with our conflicts in the Middle East on healthy young troops that mostly had penetrating trauma, very different than the other crash trial, which was mostly blunt trauma. This looked at studies on patients. Again, very good data here. Number needed to treat, 15. Number needed to reduce mortality, and I'm sorry, transfusions, seven. So it reduced mortality, reduced transfusions in a very powerful way. And this also further put tranexamic acid up. And I think right now, most trauma centers worldwide are recommending that if you have a trauma patient who is needing blood products and they have been injured within the last three hours, they are probably recommending to give one gram of tranexamic acid up front, followed by continued tranexamic acid infusions in the ICU. But what I'm here to talk about today, are there other uses for tranexamic acid beyond the trauma patient? Because I know I'm not speaking to a trauma audience, but I think it's important to understand the foundation of work that's been done for tranexamic acid and then explore where it might be used because there are some better uses for this outside of trauma. And I wanna show them to you right now. The woman trial happened. The woman trial looked at postpartum hemorrhage and they compared placebo to tranexamic acid and they found out that bleeding was reduced, mortality was reduced in patients suffering from post-delivery uh, post hemorrhage. And this was something that I think most RBs are starting to use. I also discovered that many cardiothoracic surgeons are using high doses of tranexamic acid. I'm talking 10, 20, 30 grams in some centers are recommended for open heart cases of valve and transplants and cabbages and these sorts of things. My oral surgeon colleagues are using this on people with compl complicated extractions, especially those on anticoagulation. Orthopedic injuries are being treated with total joints, receiving intraarticular as well as IV tranexamic acid. I also discovered that this can make your skin very light and pale like me. Your beautiful tanned Mexican skin can go away with tranexamic acid. I, I don't know who's using this, but I found it humorous that they have tranexamic acid suntan lotion. So uh, ah, consider using this. All right, I have five cases I'm gonna go through pretty quickly and talk about where tranexamic acid might be used. Okay, case number one, a nosebleed, bad nosebleeds. Does anybody like treating nosebleeds? Nobody? I love, hey, nosebleeds, all right. I love treating nosebleeds, my friends. Okay, these are good, these are challenging. I love treating complicated nosebleeds. Now, the world literature on tranexamic acid in nosebleeds was done in Iran of all places. And I don't know if it's so dry with the desert that they get nosebleeds all the time, but Zaher, he has done all the research on tranexamic acid in nosebleeds. There's been some good studies. So they looked at 216 patients that had nosebleeds and they said, let's compare tranexamic acid to typical lidocaine, epinephrine, and a little tetracycline on some gauze. What they found was tranexamic acid stopped the bleed in less than 10 minutes. Dramatic differences. Also, people were discharged out of the emergency department, my home. We have a new bed. We can move this through. We can see more patients. This is good. It did not re-bleed in 24 hours, nor in seven days. These are amazing differences for the use of tranexamic acid and nosebleed patients. Next, same man, Zahid, and his team in Iran, they looked at patients on antiplatelets. Now, most of these were aspirin, but a good number, maybe a fourth of the patients were on things like Plavix, Effiant, Relenta, some more powerful antiplatelet agents. Again, a lot of the same metrics. Guess what happened? Tranexamic acid one. Again, 73 versus 29% at stopping the bleeding quickly in 10 minutes. They did not re-bleed within a day or a week. They were discharged out of the emergency department. And look at this. The patients were satisfied. Yeah. 
Happy patient, happy doctor. So what's my summary? If I've got a patient that has a nosebleed, I don't always use tranexamic acid. But if someone has come back with a second visit, treated them earlier, now they're back to see your friend, I will give tranexamic acid, I will put it on my favorite inflatable balloon or Miracel gauze packing instrument, and I will pack that with tranexamic acid. Also, if someone takes antiplatelets, anticoagulated patients, this is a very good therapy to reduce bleeding quickly and also prevent rebleeding in a week's time. So consider tranexamic acid for your nose bleeding patients. Your next case is someone with a sore throat. And you pick up the chart, you think, well, I'm going to go in the room and I'm going to see somebody that might have strep throat. But you quickly realize that this person just had their tonsils removed and they're bleeding. They're bleeding bad. The nurse says, doctor, all of their vital signs are 80. Think, oh my gosh. Pulse is 80, blood pressure is 80, respiratory rate 80. So everything's bad. So the first question we need to ask ourselves is, does tranexamic acid prevent post-tonsillectomy bleeds? If you do surgery on somebody and you give them tranexamic acid, will that stop them from bleeding? Well, they looked at this and there was a meta-analysis of about seven studies that were done. And the conclusion was, Tranexamic acid does not stop someone from developing a post-tonsillectomy bleed. It will happen or it will not happen. Tranexamic acid does not stop it from happening. But a better question, does tranexamic acid reduce bleeding, duration, and blood loss and mortality when someone develops a, a post-tonsillectomy bleed? They come to see you at your hospital, they're bleeding, what if we give tranexamic acid at that time? Does it work? One trial was done, and to answer this question, I have to know what Star Wars, Jimmy Carter, John Madden, and post-tonsillectomy bleeds all have in common. Does anyone know the answer to this question? This man's smiling. It all happened in 1977. Okay. That's 40 years ago. That's a long time ago. Old research. But one study was done to show that tranexamic acid reduced the duration of blood loss in post-tonsillectomy bleeds in 1977. So is there no real data these days? Well, there's some data we found in the nose. I'm showing you other data. We talked about all of its use. I am not giving this to my patients, but if there is bad bleeding like this, I am intubating the patient. I am then going and I'm taking ring forceps and I'm packing the tonsillar pillars. I'm calling my ear, nose, and throat surgeon to come help. I'm going to pack them with tranexamic acid if I see a patient, okay? Because this is very bad. People die from this in the United States. And this is a last ditch effort. This is aggressive care, like Matt told me, aggressive care. All right, the next case I don't know if this translates well, but it's bright red bleeding per rectum, the GI bleed. Now, your patients take selfies? Yeah? Do your patient take selfies of their toilet? Hey, look, doctor, I have blood. Look, look. Yes, you have blood. So before someone has a bad GI bleed and they're dying from this, and you're going to get the Blakemore tube, I want you to think about tranexamic acid and find out if this has a home in your toolbox for treating patients who are dying from GI bleeds. Now, surprisingly, there have been a number of studies. Now, look at this. I was born in 1974. That's an old study, 1973, 76. A lot of studies done to answer, does tranexamic acid save lives of people that are bleeding from a GI bleed? Now. There was a Cochrane review in 2014 that looked at 1,700 patients in all of these studies. And they said all of these studies favored tranexamic acid. But it did not meet the power and it was not clinically significant. One of the critiques they brought up, they said, this is before we have proton pump inhibitors. 
before we used antibiotics for peptic ulcer bleeds. This is before we had interventional radiology. This is before we had endoscopy with all these sclerotherapies and tricks and bands and things we could do. So it's hard to compare what we do today to what we did back in 1970s. So the clinical question is not whether tranexamic acid is better than placebo. The question is whether tranexamic acid is better than current treatments. And in order to do that, you say yes, we need additional trials. And that's the way every Cochrane database review ends, correct? Every Cochrane database says, well, we don't know, we need more trials. Why don't you go do research and we'll talk about it some more. I hate that. So before you flush the data, don't flush the data. The HALT-IT trial is coming soon. International, randomized, double-blind, controlled comparison of tranexamic acid versus placebo in patients with GI bleeds. We will find out within the next year or two if tranexamic acid has a home for treating our patients with massive GI bleeds. My suspicion is that it will, but I will await the data before I certify that recommendation. And I hope that this study will come out to guide me and you as we care for our patients. The next case is a patient with shortness of breath. I remember early in my career, I had a patient come in on American Independence Day. I was working. He was young. He was my age. He had a wife. He had a 13-year-old son. He was healthy, but he came in that day with massive hemoptysis. Massive hemoptysis. We intubated him. We transfused him. We provided selective lung ventilation. We called our thoracic surgeon. We called interventional radiology. We had our critical care specialist. We had a team of surgeons and doctors ready to take care of this guy. And despite everything we did, he died right in front of me. And I had to tell his wife and his 13-year-old son that he died and that I could not save his life. And I hate that case. And I know you have had cases like that. And so what I want to challenge you with is I did not use tranexamic acid that day because I did not know about it. But in cases like that, when you want to provide maximally aggressive care to your patients, we might consider tranexamic acid. Again, there's been a lot of work done to try to answer this question. And the results have been not as strong as in other areas when we talk about hemoptysis. I will point you to this meta-analysis, which looked at the papers I just showed you. They found there was no difference in readmission. The bleeding was shortened a little bit. And again, surprising, one case report of thrombosis in an older man who had metastatic cancer, who had a history of DVTs and PEs. Yes, one person developed a thrombosis. Was it because of tranexamic acid? I can't say it was, but again, this is one case report of all of these studies that have shown thrombosis. Again, tranexamic acid is an antifibrinolytic, not a procoagulant. There was one double-blind control, randomized controlled trial, 46 patients, tranexamic acid versus placebo. Low numbers did not show a difference in that one trial. There was an Argentine PhD candidate who did their research on tranexamic acid versus placebo, and they found that it reduced the shorter course of hemoptysis. So, what is my conclusion for tranexamic acid and hemoptysis? I don't think it's for every patient that coughs up a little bit of blood. But like my patient on Independence Day who was dying in front of me, this might be a case for considering using tranexamic acid. The way I use this, I take a gram of tranexamic acid, I put it into a nebulizer, I nebulize this into the patient. It goes directly to the lungs. And that's the way I do it. All right, our next case, we just talked about a case of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. I'm gonna move into uh, cases of traumatic head injuries. So let's say you have a person that has a subdural hematoma, maybe epidural hematoma, interparenchymal bleed, 
traumatic subarachnoid. There have actually been some good trials done using tranexamic acid on this population. The one I'll talk about now is a Japanese trial, 2010. 240 patients with closed head injuries were given tranexamic acid against placebo. They showed reduced growth of hematoma size. They also showed a reduction in mortality. Very promising trial. Joe Carr did a case report or a, a trial in 2017, tranexamic acid versus placebo. Less growth of the hematoma was found. In that study, they found out that it was reduced from 1.7 at 48 hours versus the people with the placebo at 48 hours, their hematoma grew by 4.3 cubic millimeters. So very interesting trials. The CRASH-2 trial actually had a retrospective arm where they looked at a regression analysis of a certain patient population that had head injuries. And they found that this did reduce the hematoma size at 24 hours and 48 hours, but the power of their trial showed that this was not statistically significant. But again, these numbers are good. We're seeing trends that it's reducing the hematoma size. And if you're talking about blood in my brain, man, that might be worth it. Now, the side effect from tranexamic acid is seizure. High doses of tranexamic acid and patients that have had pre-existing seizure conditions might need to have special consideration when given tranexamic acid because that is a side effect of high doses or patients with seizures is it lowers the seizure threshold. And you might consider that specifically with patients with head injuries. So what is my recommendation? How do I manage my patients that have head injuries? I am not using tranexamic acid yet, specifically because of the risk of surgery and because the data has not been overwhelming. Now, in 2019, we expect results from the CRASH-3 trial. They're, right now, they've already got 12,000 patients, international, multi-center, randomized controlled trial, tranexamic acid versus placebo, and patients with head injuries to find out if this is going to be a good therapy for our patients with head injuries. So look forward to this result soon. What about TPA? We have a lot of patients. We have a very aggressive stroke center. We are a stroke center that we treat a lot of strokes with TPA. And we do have bleeding rates. Luckily, our bleeding rates are very low. We have very good doctors. We have a very good team. We try to select our patients well, but we still have bleeds. Tranexamic acid is the drug of choice for trying to reduce patients with TPA bleeds. You may hear of people using aminocaproic acid. Aminocaproic acid binds to the same site as tranexamic acid. Tranexamic acid has hundreds of times of binding affinity over aminocaproic acid for TPA bleeds. So consider this, and this is part of our guidelines and many other hospitals are moving towards using TXA to treat TPA bleeds. It took me three weeks to do that right. I talked about reversal of direct thrombin inhibitors, 10A inhibitors, these direct oral anticoagulants. I just got done speaking about this. Again, I would encourage you that when someone is bleeding from one of these agents, if the bleeding has happened within the first two to three hours, I would highly recommend using tranexamic acid because again, I think this is showing in a lot of trials to be a powerful agent for reversing patient's bleeding. So I would ask you, have you read the guidelines? So what is the future for tranexamic acid? Where is it going to be used in my hospital? Here's how I'm going to be using it. If I have a patient that has a post-TPA bleed, I will use this. If it's a trauma patient requiring blood, I will use tranexamic acid. If they're a life-threatening bleed on an anticoagulant, I will use tranexamic acid. Postpartum hemorrhage, tranexamic acid. If I'm looking for GI bleeds, I have to wait for the HALT trial. If I have a non-PE that's massive with hemoptysis, it's got to be a pretty bad bleed before I'm going to use tranexamic acid, but I'll nebulize that and give it to the patient. 
If I've got a stubborn nosebleed on antiplatelet, on anticoagulant, I will probably use these medications. So this is how I plan on using tranexamic acid. This is a great summary slide. If you'd like to take pictures of slides, these are my main talking points that I wanted you to understand today. And more than anything, I hope that the wonderful talks here today and the information that you've been given is going to answer that challenge that Matt gave me, that you provide maximally aggressive patient care. Give your patients the therapies they need when their life is on the line and is in your hands. Use your training, use your knowledge, use every tool you have to advocate for your patients because they deserve maximally aggressive care. Thank you.